I think we've got our next guest. Mark, how are you, sir? I am doing fine. How are you? Pretty good, actually. We have got our next guest with us today. Mark Mix joins us. He's the president of the National Right to Work Committee, and uh, it's a 2.8 million member public policy organization. He serves as the president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation, and he joins us today here in our program. We also have our good friends IQL Rizzoli and Don Mazzella with us as well. So, Mark, one of the things that is uh, going on, which I I just had to have you on to discuss this, um, this Democratic spending bill is a giant giveaway to their donors, the labor unions. Uh, they they, they want to go ahead and and have the have the lovely corporations go through and do the uh, build back better with the roads and the bridges, so they can put in tolls. So then they can tax everybody to death, uh, and then the labor unions get a big cut of this. Tell us a little bit about this, my friend. Yeah, James, it's not uh, any surprise. You know, when you're spending what four point seven million trillion. I'm sorry. Look at me. I'm, I'm in billions. <laughs> That's and millions. right. My you... goodness, we're already at trillions. I apologize. When you're spending four point seven trillion dollars, uh, there is plenty of money to go around to lots of folks. And and to your point, James, the Organized labor officials have have used and parlayed their support of this president and this Congress to basically have themselves written into a very large chunk of this four point seven trillion dollar Bahamas that actually our president tells us won't cost us anything. And so we don't have to worry about anything then, James, because it won't cost anything. (laughs) But the bottom line is this. There are literally, literally billions and billions of dollars going to organized labor, at least favoring those that have union contracts and force workers to pay dues or fees or join a union as a condition of employment. And so we start with the infrastructure bill, the $1.2 trillion. There's $43 billion in there that is set aside with just simply 16 words on page 2038 that would say any telecommunications build-out, broadband Internet stuff that they talk so much about, would go to union contractors only. So if you're a non-union contractor, if your workers have decided they didn't want to be in a union, you probably can't participate in $43 billion worth of telecommunications bill out. As far as the construction of roads and bridges, the so-called prevailing wage laws uh, apply there. The Davis-Bacon laws that were written back in the 1930s that were purely written on a, on a racist basis to keep black construction workers out of the Northeast and, and out of building, they're going to apply that. And the only way you can do business under the Davis-Bacon laws is if you have a union contract. So there are literally hundreds of billions of dollars written into that part of it. Uh, should I go farther? <laughs> Don, jump in there, my friend. Well, uh, uh, I have a lot of questions, but uh, I, my, uh, the two that come to mind, hey, I thought the Supreme Court ruled that uh, you, uh, the, um, being a member of the union, you could A, um, uh, opt out if you wanted to, and you certainly could ask them to stop political spending. And I thought that was also written in, they were trying to get around that in the bill. And um uh, two, that the, the, the bill really uh, straightjackets corporations against union organizing. Would you want to comment on that? Yeah, Don, you're up to speed on the latest. And, and those those lawsuits and those laws that you're talking about are basically results of Supreme Court decisions that we've won. In 1988, we won a case called Beck versus Communication Workers of America, which basically protected private sector workers from being forced to pay for union politics, meaning you could you could withdraw your membership. You still could be forced to pay up to 100 percent of dues as a condition of keeping your job, but you, you didn't have to be a member of the union, and if you could get the union to tell you what they were spending on politics, you could get out of that portion of it. The only problem with that, Don, is the Hobson's choice that workers face. In order to participate in union elections, to vote on the contract that governs uh, the terms and conditions of your employment, to, to participate participate in any way in the workplace when it comes to your job and and how uh, your employer is dealing with you, you have to be a member of the union. If you're a non-member, you can't can't do those types of activities that a a union member can do in the workplace. In the public sector, we won a Supreme Court case back in 2018 called Janus v. AFSCME that freed every government employee from being forced to pay fees in order to work for their government. And obviously the argument there, Don, is exactly as you said. 
you know, you, you shouldn't be forced to pay for political ideas or ideology that you disagree with. And the Supreme Court said on behalf of public sector workers, they said it was a violation of the First Amendment to force a worker to do that. So we've won a pretty good set of, uh, of you know, laws here and protections for workers, but it goes farther than that because union officials don't tell workers what they're spending on politics. They don't tell them how they can get out of the union and how they can avoid the political and ideological causes. And then they use the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill that we're dealing with today to shoehorn, you're exactly right, ways around it, workarounds, basically saying that, you know, that uh, uh, you have to, you have to, you know, your union dues get our a top of the line tax deduction or in order to, to get a $4,500 tax credit, you have to buy a unionized built electric vehicle. Or if you're a small business and you violate any labor law, you could be fined up to $100,000 for any violation. These are the types of things they're writing in. Um, they can't quite get to repeal the 27 right to work laws like they, that they're trying to do in standalone legislation that's already passed the House and the Senate. The so-called PRO Act is a smorgasbord of big labor po- privileges over workers. It doesn't do anything for workers. It does a whole lot for union officials. But they'll try every every possibility. And, and down to your point, there are several parts of the PRO Act that they've shoehorned into the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill. Well, uh, let, uh, let me go a step further. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, I believe it was yesterday, uh, said, was, I read it someplace, that uh, a union representation in the private sector, in the, in the battleground states, has plummeted uh, something like 27 to 29 percent, and that um, uh, oh, I know what uh, it's in, in the old towns that depend uh, in, in the Midwest that depended on on some industry to stay alive. But it, it seems to me, and in general, over the last 20 years, we've seen a, a total reduction in private sector uh, union jobs. The only place they've grown is in the uh, uh, government jobs. So, uh, what are you doing to um, uh, uh, keep that type going? And uh, um, can can you uh, then use the power of the courts to get some of the uh, some of these uh, uh, goodies uh, uh, overturned? We are. And, you know, James and I have talked about this in the past where the, the, the basically the rank and file workers have a much different opinion about issues and ideas than the union officials back here in Washington, D.C. And the divide between rank and file workers and union officials that claim to represent them is growing wider and wider all the time. And probably the best case study was 2016 when Donald Trump won states like Wisconsin and Michigan. And, you know, union officials looked around yeah, after spending a couple hundred million dollars to uh, – to get Hillary Clinton into the White House, they looked around and said, what the heck happened? Well, what happened was rank-and-file workers stood up and believed in policies that were articulated by President Trump at the time, or then candidate Trump at the time, you know, talking about protecting the border, uh, building back here in America, bringing manufacturing jobs back to, to the small towns that you're talking about, Don, that were part of that Wall Street Journal article. I mean, the, the attitudes and the voter preferences of those folks out there in kind of mid-America and small-town America have changed dramatically, and union officials have completely lost touch. I mean, when you have a teacher's union that tells, you know, tells kids not to tell their parents what they're teaching in school and teach critical race theory and, t- and say that it's perfectly fine for the kids to be out of school because it, it doesn't matter if they don't l- learn their times tables, they're learning about what the difference between a protest and a riot, what insurrection and a coup is. That's what they're learning about as they were out of school. And and don't worry about them being back in school because they'll get over that. I mean, that's the union leadership, so-called, and I'm using my finger quotes here, that is articulating these policies. And the rank and file workers and most ordinary Americans are running away from it as fast as they can. So may I ask a question now? Yes, I'm sorry, I do. What's the difference between the, the crime syndicate, the organized crime syndicate and the unions then? (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I have to be a little circumspect here because r- what happens, union officials have the protection of the law. Going all the way back to the 1930s when Roosevelt pushed through the National Labor Relations Act, which was the federal impingement on states' rights when it came to private sector um, unionization, he basically said that union officials had the power to force workers into their associations, into their collectives, and then he went on and said they can force them to pay up to 100% of dues and actually be a formal membership 
membership of the union. I don't think the mafia got that type of uh, privilege or power granted to them by the federal government. They, they, they obtained it through other means, but in this case, union officials have used the power of government, whether it be in state capitals or whether it be in Washington, D.C., to get the power of force. No other private organization, legal private organization in, in America has the privilege of forcing someone to do something. We gave a little bit of force to government as part of this grand experiment in self-government, this idea of a democratic republic, but we've given it to nobody else. But yet union officials still to this day get to exercise the ability to fi- have a worker fired if they don't pay them for the right to work. The mafia did a little bit differently, and sometimes the sheriff and the police would show up if they, if they got caught. In the case of government forced unionism, government-imposed forced unionism, it's still legal under law. But we're working on that. We've got the Supreme Court to protect the First Amendment rights of public sector employees. We've got some work to do to protect those same rights for private sector employees. Fantastic. Sorry, go on. Um, uh, it's ironic you said that because the, I read a story uh, in the last two days about uh, how the, the five families here in New York – uh, are not let, letting uh, uh, younger people in because they feel they're not tough enough to be m- members of the mob. Uh, I, I just thought I just thought it was interesting. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But uh, could I ask you this question? I mean, the, the decision uh, is I, I believe it was Amazon where uh, the, the the voters vote the uh, employees voted overwhelmingly. Uh, f- uh, not to go to a union, and then the NLRB uh, overturned it based on the mailbox outside the. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah Don, you're you're really well state. informed about that. Yep, you're really well informed about that. That was probably the biggest union election we've had in the last couple of years. It was basically a a five thousand two hundred member unit down in Bessemer, Alabama, at a distribution warehouse. And if you read the papers, read the so-called mainstream media, and listened to the President of the United States, who actually did a video encouraging those workers to vote for unionization, it was the only way they were going to have power in the workplace. And literally, international uh, politicians chimed in and said, you know, we've got to get this, you, you have to get unionized down there at Bessemer, Alabama. But basically, the union of those voting in that election, less than 24, I think it was 24 percent of the workers voted for the union, um, voted to have the union represent them. And if you took all of the workers in the unit, even those that didn't vote, I think it was roughly just about 17 or 13 percent of the workers who said, yes, we would like a union represent it. When they interviewed, you, you know, workers at the place, they said, we got a great situation here. Obviously, in a big organization with 5,200 employees, things go wrong all the time. But they said they were happy with their benefits, happy with their pay, and it was a huge, huge defeat for organized labor. But you're right, Don. The NLRB came in and said that because Amazon set up a United States post office box in front of their shop to help make it easier for workers to cast a vote because it was a mail ballot election. Workers had to mail in their ballots. The NLRB is deciding whether or not to have a rerun of that election because they think giving workers a a, a more of opportunity to cast their votes was somehow a violation of the labor uh, labor law in this country. When in fact the statutory means for selecting a union as your bargaining representative, it, the statute says it has to be a secret ballot election. But in this case, the NLRB sets up you know card check elections. They allow that if the unions can get a certain number of cards signed, they can be recognized. Or if they make it easier for workers to cast ballots, that somehow is a violation of the law. Yeah, I I, I read read the case. Uh, and I, I saw. I don't know if you saw the sixty, uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, national TV and television thing, where where they they interviewed four people who voted for it and no one who voted against it. I thought that was, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, you know, to, uh, we had a guest on just before you that uh, said how uh, it's very difficult to get the message across. Um, uh, IQ, do you want to say anything, or can I can go on? No, no, go on, please, go on. Um, uh, l- let me ask you this now: um, uh, uh, the right to vote, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, right to work law, is to me one of the um, uh, best ways of uh, containing the union. What are you going to do to uh, fight this tide? In, over the next uh, two years, uh, two years. 
Well, first of all, we've got to we've got to defeat the the policies that are working their way through Congress right now. As I mentioned, this so-called Pro Act, which would repeal all 27 right to work laws, has already passed the House with no committee hearings and no testimony, and it's in the Senate. And as you already indicated, they're trying to take pieces of this thing and, you know, shoehorn it into the uh, infrastructure bill and the reconciliation bill. So we've got to defeat that. But what the most important job we have is to continue to get the word out about forced unionism. And and that requires uh, opportunities like this. And, James, I thank you for the opportunity to bring us on and uh, all of us to talk about these issues. Because when you ask an American about whether or not union officials should have the power to force a worker to pay dues or fees to get or keep a job, out of over 8 out of 10 Americans believe it's wrong. So the best way to change this and the best way to continue to uh, oppose forced unionism and promote voluntary unionism is to have conversations like this and have the Congress vote on these issues. I mean, the House has already voted. 225 members of the House already voted, some of them from right-to-work states that have right-to-work protections already on the books. That doesn't stop anyone from joining a union if they want to, but it just says you can't be forced to pay dues or fees to keep your job or to get a job. Very, very simple stuff. But those were, those politicians have already voted saying, yes, I'm in favor of federally imposed forced unionism. Now what the job is is to make sure that people in their state and their districts understand the votes that were cast to maintain and expand forced unionism out of workers. And we know that the American people find out about this type of stuff and we get the information out there. They change their behavior about the politicians they support. And that's yep. how it should work in a democratic republic. We loan our power. To elected officials. We, we elect them to, to basically speak for us. And when they don't speak for us, we take that power away. And I know sometimes in some districts and some states across the country, it's very hard to take that power away. In fact, there are those that make the case that it's impossible. I don't believe in impossible. We have a right to work law in Michigan. People told me that was impossible, but we got it done. And so I believe the, in the art of the possible, and, and I think if we continue to have conversations like this, continue to get the word out about the power that organized labor has that sometimes can be equated with that of the mafia and, and uh, those bosses of, of cities around the country, we can win the day. And it, but it comes to being you know, educating constituents about what their power and how it works is all about. You made a fantastic statement. There is no such thing as impossible. I've always said if you have the will, you succeed. Yeah. Yeah. But, and we believe that. We believe that. Yeah. I, I believe in it too. But can I point out something to you uh, I, for another uh, program? I've been watching this. The last five days, the New York Times, the, the, the paper of record, has not <laughs> mentioned the southern border in any story it has in its print or in its um, online services the last five yeah. days. Yeah. How do you... Well, that's not a surprise. Yeah, that's not, not a, surprise. a surprise. I mean... But, but, it's, yeah. but it sets the agenda. Uh, it's unfortunate, uh, but any newsman will tell you that the time sets the agenda. Yet, how do you break through, through this? I mean, uh, I have to tell you that if I hadn't dug deeper. Uh, I, I would not know half of the stuff that you're mentioning. And there's a couple of things that you mentioned today that I like to say I'm a very well-informed newsman. I did not know. But uh, how do you break through that? Well, I think what you have to do and what has been happening is you build around it. I mean, the, the you know, obviously back when I was a young, a young boy growing up and, and we had a chance to watch the news, I mean, you know, when Walter Carnkate came on and said what was happening in the world, we believed him. And then we found out that it ne necessarily what the big mainstream media establishments like the New York Times and the Washington Post and, and others, we found out that they weren't really interested in telling us the truth. They were telling us what they believe, what they believe to be uh, important, but what wasn't really important. And so just like other opportunities, like, you know, the, the taxi monopoly, all of a sudden the workaround is Uber and Lyft, an algorithm that basically allows people to turn on a machine and turn it off and pick up people and provide a product or an alternative to a, t a taxi monopoly. 
monopoly. I mean, the right to work law is a great example. In you know, when we had states that had forced unionism, manufacturing didn't feel like there was an opportunity to get out. And now that right to work laws have passed in 27 states, you know, the automotive industry has moved from kind of the the Rust Belt region of the Great Lakes, which is now actually right to work. It's in the we passed five new right to work laws in the last 10 years, including Wisconsin, Michigan, and Indiana, where there was a huge footprint of of automotive manufacturing. But it started moving to the south, where workers and and capital and labor could work together to basically help everybody. And the bottom line is there are workarounds and alternatives. And what you're doing by having this interview and and having this conversation, we're working around the establishment media as people tune in. The Internet has provided uh, a workaround, and they, they begin to realize how big of a workaround that is because they're trying to shut it down and trying to keep things off of of the internet but you know (laughs) where there's a will there's a way and and we just have to keep working around it and stay stay persistent um and stay you know and just continue to talk about these issues whatever means we can i mean people do go out and try to find additional information there is some subset of our population that will take everything they hear and say that must be real but I think there's a growing population in America that says, you know what, let me do my own research, just like you said you were doing. And I think that's a good thing. And while it doesn't happen fast enough, it's happening. And that's where we have to rely on continuing to get the word out. Uh, I, for one, say keep going at it. But could I just point out something to you? I worked as a copy boy with Huntley Brinkley. I'm going to tell you how old I am. Okay. Amen. <laughs> But um, when we put together the show, it was not what we thought was the, uh, should be on the show, but what were the main issues of the day, okay? I can tell you that from having sat there for almost a year. But um, today, what you say, what you just said is true. They want to, uh, the media talks about what they want to talk about rather than what's important. But, uh, and what you're saying is, is, is you're, is you're uh, hitting it with little, uh, little rocks one at a time. Do you think you can uh, be able to pull down the edifice before it pulls us down? I think so. Um, you know, I, I, it, it, that's interesting you talk, uh, you, you, you raise those issues because it, it is very easy for us as Americans to think that there's nothing ever been like this in the country and we're, we're, you know, there's no hope, but I, you know, it, it's almost hubris of, of us in this generation. And I know we're, I'm talking with a couple of generations here. I'm, I'm getting a little long in the tooth myself, but, but here's what I would say to that is that America has gone through quite a bit and she's taken a lot of, a lot of shelling and a lot of hits and, and, by golly, she's still alive and she's still working. And, and there are still people that believe in who and what we are. And, you know, I just think we got, we just got to keep at it. And yes, that edifice that you talk about, I mean, one day you had the, you had the Berlin wall, you know, that, that kept people in, it was designed to keep people in and stop freedom. And one day you wake up in the morning and there's thousands of people surrounding it and the things falling down and you find out that the, the concrete's eroding and the rebar's eroded and rusted and the, 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 that wall, that symbol of compulsion and force and, and tyranny fell. And, you know, I, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it, but I do, I do believe it's hard. I mean, you guys, you three couldn't continue to do what you're doing if you didn't believe we could make a difference. And I believe the same thing. So we just have to keep at it, keep fighting. They'll come for us one day and, and, and put, try to keep us quiet, but, but there'll be another voice that will rise up. And that's what I do believe. And on the issue of forced unionism, we have made so much progress from the days when the federal government said you're forced to join an organization and pay an organization in order to work. The fact that we've got 27 states that have right to work laws, the fact that we've won a U.S. Supreme Court case upholding the First Amendment rights of all public sector workers across the country gives me hope that there's a lot more left in this fight than uh, than we might imagine. Amen. Question. Exactly. Yes, go ahead. Why do you only have 27 states? Why shouldn't it be 50 states? I don't understand why the governors <laughs> of the other states have a different point of view. Why? Well, you know, James got to that a little bit early. They, they, they're, they're paying off their constituents. And, you know, sometimes when you ask questions like that, you follow the money. 
And uh, when you follow the money trail from big labor bosses in Washington, D.C. and across the country, you find out that they give probably anywhere from 95 to 98 percent of all their money to one political party. I won't tell you who that is, just to be fair, but I think you can figure it out. And that explains a lot why these politicians do the things they do. So they're bought. They sold out. <laughs> That's what you're telling me. Yeah. Well, Essentially. Um, I'll let you say it, but I think we can draw our own oh, conclusions. Okay. I will say I agree, I agree with you because you're an American citizen. I'm not an American citizen, so I don't give a damn. Yes, well, uh, bought, your organization. Uh, uh, can I ask your organization again? But uh, our organization, the National Right to Work Committee and the National Right to Work Foundation. Okay. This one, yep. I want to make sure. I want to run them down and follow you. Run, run them down. You'll find some great information. And we, we, we actually are out there on that amazing internet or interweb, whatever you want to call it. And that's a, that's another vehicle that we use to get a hold of people and have people call us and and tr and learn about their rights and exercise their rights. In fact, the cases that we argue, we. We've argued 18 cases in front of the United States Supreme Court on behalf of employees whose rights have been violated. We have 21 staff attorneys who do nothing but represent employees. As of today, active today, we have about 238 cases pending right now in various levels of the court system, including the National Labor Relations Board, federal courts. We have two cases still pending at the U.S. Supreme Court right now that we're asking them to hear about the rights of, of pu public sector employees and how union officials violate those rights. I mean, it's an ongoing battle. It's one that we continue to fight. And, and boy, it's, uh, I've had no problem getting up in the morning and going to work because there's still liberty, be, liberty to be protected and freedom to be re restored. So we just need to keep at it.